Mm. No, I don't disagree. Yeah. Was it, it wasn't an option? No. That's interesting. Oh yeah, you wanted to get in. Well, welcome everybody. Good morning. Thanks for coming. Good morning. I just see you everywhere. Did you bring your plants? We had breakfast in the park this morning. So. I got plants in my trunk. Lynette has a plan for you. And so I no, walk out with like not, five of them. But it's inside. Yeah, it's inside. I know, I saw that. It was lower than we'd like, yeah. I mean, Breakfast in the Park, for those of you that don't know, it's an annual thing that the affiliates put on for all realtor members. It's at Dogwood Park in North Canton, and they've done it since, I mean, before I was even in real estate. Uh, so they've done it every year, and they have plants there, and everybody pretty much gets a plant that comes. Um, they do raffles, door prizes, and things like that, and the affiliates all make breakfast for us. So it's a good time. Yeah, we can. Yeah, bring a hand good and we donate that to uh, Stark Hunger Stark Hunger Task Force. Say that with braces three times. Okay. So, it's a good way to catch up with other realtors as well as the affiliates. And yeah. They come with great plans. They are nice plans. Nolan's, Nolan's, if you know where that is. I don't know where it is, but that's who donated those all. So, yeah. All right. Well, we'll get started this morning again. Thanks for coming. So, what to know about real estate. This has got some updates to it. Um, I've, take, I've done the class before. So those of you, you may hear the repetition of it. Um, the class is usually about an hour and a half-ish, somewhere in there. There's not too many slides, but just to kind of give you an idea of what we're gonna cover, it's all the things you didn't learn in real estate school that you should know if you're out here selling real estate in the real world. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and dive in. All right, so let's talk a little bit about advertising because, of course, when you first get into real estate, the first thing you want to do is advertise your services for sale, uh, that you have a house either listed for sale or that you are advertising your services as a buyer. So one of the things, and it covers later in the slide here, um, I don't know why the slideshow didn't turn over. Let's see here from the beginning. So I'm just not the tech guy. Here we go. Let's try that. How about that? All right. All right. So licensing law for the state of Ohio is different than other states. So if you're coming from somewhere else, you may not realize it. But Ohio has a law where we call it the equal prominence rule when it comes to advertising the name of your brokerage and your name as a real estate agent. Now you're going to see that most real estate agents never follow this rule. Okay. Um, you're going to see it all the time. You're going to go, wait, my broker said you can't do that, and you can't do it. The problem is people are not getting trained in for it, and the Division of Real Estate only has about six or seven investigators in the entire state of Ohio. And unless somebody turns somebody in, whether it's a member of the public or another real estate agent for something, they kind of have blinders on because they're super busy worried about the whole thing. They're actually so just to give you an idea, right? So Keller Williams obviously doing a franchise, the Lightning Challenge, which we have Keller Williams is When I say prominence rule, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the size of the letter. It could be the font. It could be the placement on whatever advertising you're doing. So it's not necessarily just the words. So I ask again, what is the name of our brokerage? 
Legacy, legacy group realty. So when you renew your license, you're renewing it with legacy group realty. When you're advertising, it's always Keller Williams legacy group realty. Okay, any questions about that? You can shorten it to KW. Um, I will tell you now that we have Keller Williams is actually a brokerage in Ohio. So those of you that don't know, Keller Williams International opened up a brokerage to kind of compete with EXP and some of the larger statewide brokerages, and it's actually called Keller Williams. So there's going to be some confusion because people automatically don't say Legacy Group Realty as it is now. They say Keller Williams, right? So um, there is a Keller Williams franchise, and so I will tell you that we'll see how this goes in the future with advertising and how the division looks at this, but for right now, you could use KW, um, that is approved by Keller Williams International, but when you're using it in, I guess, wording, it would be okay, but you should just be using our logo. That's really what you should be using in, in your advertising. But if it's in a wording, you could put KW. Yeah. If I was going to be approved to like Chevelle, it would be like, come here, we have a much smaller brokerage name, therefore your name is actually bigger, and if you go to Legacy Group Realty, well, we took it to the ALC originally, and we wanted to shorten our name to Keller Williams Legacy. That's just what we wanted to do. Unfortunately, three years ago, the ALC poo-pooed it and said, nope, we don't want that. And it was for that very reason that we didn't want to be Legacy Group Realty because of the advertising and prominent rules. Um, I'm not saying that we couldn't take that back to the ALC, the problem is you have to remember every single real estate sign and piece of advertising that you have out there would have to be gone. So you're replacing all of your signs, all of your print advertising, your websites, and updating everything for every single agent in the brokerage. That's why they decided not to do it. So, yep. All right. So when I say all forms of advertising, that's exactly what I mean. You will see that people create t-shirts that just say, Cosgrove group on them. Or they say Keller Williams Cosgrove group, or it might say Keller Williams Rich Cosgrove. All of that is illegal. It's all wrong. It must say Keller Williams Legacy Group Realty on whatever it is that you're advertising. So if you're wrapping your car, if it's any kind of clothing, pens, any giveaways, your website, all of it has to have the name of the brokerage on. So it is a little bit cumbersome because of the length of the name and the prominence rule, but it's licensing law. If you get turned in, it can be a fine of up to $500 per occurrence, which means that every real estate sign, every business card, everything that you have out there, every single thing is up to $500. So it's not cheap. Okay. No, um, yep. Just kind of really quick. So you can just have Keller Williams Legacy Group You don't as long as you have the broker's name, yes, you can okay. use the logo or you can use the wording. But as I was saying, you know, to Linda, you could put KW Legacy Group Realty. Legacy Group Realty is the name of the broker. So you're compliant when it comes to the division of real estate. As far as the franchise goes, if the Keller Williams, if you're going to use it, it should be the KW in red, the way that Keller Williams has you do it. If it's in any other um, color, we may not be compliant with Keller Williams International. So again, is there somebody necessarily policing that every single time? No, but you really, the brand power is what you're looking for. So the red KW, like it's back here on the check that we have in the back of the room, that's the brand that people know. So if you're changing it in your advertising, it really doesn't do you or the brand much good. Yeah. as long as it's in there somewhere so if it's in your letter somewhere if it's on your website anywhere as long as you have the name of the brokerage in whatever form of advertising now a thank you letter that's not a form of advertising you're not really advertising now i will say most people have on their business card they put their business card in the thank you letter or whatever but if it's a form of advertising that's what you need so a thank you letter i would not consider a form of advertising I would still put my information in there, but I don't think that you would have a problem if you did. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm doing a little bit of processing right now. Okay. Yep. And I'm just curious if like the first paragraph is like, I'm doing that. 
You could, as long as it has the name of the brokerage. So if you're doing prospecting, it just has to be somewhere. Yep. Yep. Hey, Rich. Yes. So I know at two meetings in Tracy, Sandy talks. She talks about doing how she does like branded gifts when she goes to a wedding. Yeah. That is technically a form of advertising. It is. So you set the money to have the GFA logo on that, as well as like, so if we did something like Kelly Foods, it would have to be on there. Yeah. And that's where the prominence rule, it gets so tricky because when you're trying to do like, you know, a water bottle or something like that, and you can see where the names are, you know, typically you want your name because you're trying to brand yourself. The problem is you have to have any form of advertising, the prominence rule applies. So if you're giving out a water bottle and your name is three times the size of Kelly Williams Legacy Group Realty, that's a problem. And prominence is such a vague term the division can say the placement of your name versus the, the brokerage name on your advertising. So you'll see some agents have on the front of their card, it'll say all of their information. On the back of the card, it is Keller Williams Legacy Group. Huge, bold, beautiful letters, the size of the entire card. The problem is you don't see the back of the card when you're looking at the front of the card, right? When you're handing out that card. The division hasn't ruled on that, but I can tell you, I don't want to be the person that's in front of the division that says you gave out how many of these cards and I'm going to find you even a dollar for every single one you gave out that I can prove. I mean, it's, it's a problem and it's your business. So you have to run it the way that you want to just know that if you're not in compliance with the prominence rule, you could, you could be used as an example at some point with the division. I mean, let's face it, it's kind of the wild west out here right now, and people are turning each other in left and right or angry with one another, at, at least anyway. So, yeah. Um, so just try and always have the, the Keller Williams Legacy Group Realty as prominent as you possibly can on your advertising. So. If it's Keller Williams approved, so if it comes from our office yeah. and we have the logo, you can use it that way. Yeah, it doesn't always have to be the red. We have black and white logos and things like that. Just make sure that it's something that we're giving you from our office. You're not designing it on your own. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Rich. Yes. Just a request. Can you repeat the questions aloud as people are asking from the room so we can hear them in Mansfield? Yes, I can. So the Thank question you. was, are you able to use a white KW instead of the red? Does it have to be red? And the answer is you can use a white KW. You can use anything that Keller Williams International provides to our office that we would provide to you. Yes. Good? Okay. So I asked you, now that we go over this prominence and I tell you the name of the brokerage, I'm going to ask you which one of these is the correct way to advertise if I were to do this. Okay. All right, we're gonna say the one on the top left is number one, the one below it is number two, number three is the top right, and number four is the bottom right. So I say, which one out of one, two, three, or four would you say is the correct advertising? Okay. One and two. No. Okay, so Scott, Scott, I'm going to use Scott as an example. <laughs> Scott said number one, and that's not right. Why is that not right? Can anybody say why? There's no realty on the end of it. Yeah. So, so the correct one is actually going to be number two, which is the bottom left, because my name is a little bit smaller and it's not as bold as Keller Williams Legacy Group Realty. Now, one of the interesting things is our name has realty in it. Not everybody has to have that. OK, so, for example, Howard Hanna doesn't maybe their legal name is not Howard Hanna Realty, it's Howard Hanna. Sadly, our founding fathers of Legacy Group decided to put in the word realty. You don't have to use that word in the event that it wasn't in your legal name, but it is in our legal name. So we can't even be Keller Williams Legacy. We have to be Legacy Group Realty. Yes. Um, so just to go on that, so I was really thinking it was the one to the right. Um, the second one. Uh, um, just because whenever you combine those two rows, it's the same size as your name. So the font has to be the same. All right, so you're bringing up something great. So like I said before, the word prominence is very vague, right? So if I look at, if I, if I cross out everything on this screen except for the top right, what is the first thing that pops out at you in this? Rich Cosgrove, right? 
So because of that, I would argue that Rich Cosgrove is more prominent than Keller Williams Legacy Group Realty. So I'm not the division, and I'm only telling you what I can answer in my experience of what I've been trained on and what I've seen. Um, you don't want to be the person in front of the division, though, trying to litigate this, because again, we just answered, you know, what, how many people in this room all said that Rich Cosgrove was more prominent. Yeah. And so that's why I say it's placement, it's size, it's font. It doesn't necessarily mean that something is bold, something isn't. It could be where you placed it on the piece of paper or the advertising of the car or what have you. Yep. Rick? I'm just going to jump in. Everybody was hung up about MCG driven being really long and shorter is better. So I'm Keller Williams driven. Um, and my name is Rick Tannenbaum. So the short name makes it really hard. The short living, yeah. the short brokerage name makes it really hard for Rick Tannenbaum to be compliant. So don't get caught up on the, on the whether Legacy Group Realty is what is too long or not. So those of you in Zoom land, so uh, Rick here, again, from Living, he's the broker at Living, so he made an excellent point. So his last name is Tannenbaum, and even though their brokerage name is Living, it's very hard for him to advertise the opposite, though we have Legacy Group Realty, which is very long. That would be better for his last name because it's longer, but because he's with Living, it's so short, but Tannenbaum, it's very hard to advertise that, so... I like that, Rick, and I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I know. Uh, no, we need you as a broker in living, so you're staying, right? I knew that if anybody was going to say anything, it'd be Lynette Tilly. I'm like, oh, I can't read my name. Well, it's fine. We can read your And again, Ohio, that's just their rule. That's the prominence rule. So. I mean, I'm just saying, you could make my name well, you'd have to make living bigger is his point. Living would have to be ginormous. Living has to be more prominent. So living would be ginormous compared to Tannenbaum. I know. You guys are never allowed to bring Lynette Kelly into the classroom. All right. All right. Moving on. Um, easier said than done, but yes, I mean, it, it, anything can be changed. Um, I would tell you to get involved with Ohio Realtors because they are who would lobby that change with the division of real estate. So, yep. It's definitely not every state. It is not every state. Ohio has some of the strongest real estate rules, um, in the country. So, yeah. All right, so let's talk about advertising a listing because as you're a brand new agent or you're an experienced agent, listings right now are hard to come by and uh, you have to make sure that you're advertising them properly and not stealing them from another brokerage or another agent. So I say to you, the questions you need to ask yourself before you're advertising a listing is, is the listing yours? And by, what I mean by that is not Keller Williams Legacy Group, is it yours as Linda Sigmund? If it is, then of course, advertise it as you would anything else. Does it belong to Keller Williams Legacy Group? So does Zarice have a listing that I want to advertise? Well, the rule here is you are welcome to advertise any listing within the brokerage as long as you have the permission of the listing agent. There are agents here that would prefer you not advertise their listing because they want to be the one to collect the buyer call and things like that. Now, you cannot help that an IDX feed feeds out on your website and you have everything listed. But you can control whether you're actually publicly advertising a Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is that you would be doing on social media. Um, you can't stick a sign in somebody else's yard. Um, that's not your listing or anything like that. That's definitely something that we've seen. So um, I know, sorry, Linda, dash, dash it all. So, so. Just stick aside in the yard and sell the house. Who cares if they want it? So, does the listing belong to Keller Williams Legacy Group? Do you have the other broker's written permission to advertise? So, if I want to advertise a Cutler, a Howard Hanna, a Remax, anybody else's listing, I can't just get the listing agent's permission. I need the broker's permission, and it needs to be in writing. 
Now, very rare are you going to get that. I cannot ever think of a time that somebody has ever emailed me in my experience. Rick, how are you? Okay. Another brokerage has never emailed us to say, I want to advertise your listing at my brokerage. It just doesn't happen. Now, it could happen. Maybe somebody at another company gets a late listing that you advertise at all the time and you want to solicit buyers for that. And maybe they aren't as experienced and you know, maybe they let you do it. I don't know. It could happen. But nonetheless, you need the broker's written permission, not the listing agent. And, uh, do you have a color when you uh, legacy with the listing agent's permission? Yeah. Everybody's different. He'll talk in a second too about the one click rule, meaning. So, Home Snap is an IDX feed. Okay, so when you're sharing that with your client, it's coming from the MLS directly and that's IDX feed, just like it would be on any other website. That's absolutely okay. You can share any home through the HomeSnap app, through the MLS. It is going to be branded to your information, but it's giving credit through the MLS to the other broker. So you're okay with that. Where I'm talking about is if you're stealing, and I say stealing because that's really what you're doing. If you're taking pictures from the MLS and you're posting it, so Zarif has a listing, and I take that listing and I say, come see my great listing over here at 1234 Main Street. I can't wait to show it to you. It's going to be open on Sunday. Maybe he's the one holding it open. I'm not even holding it open. I have now taken his pictures, which I don't have authorization to do, and his listing to make it look like I am the listing representative, which I'm not. So you can't do that. Right. Yeah. So, and we will cover some of that here. Um, but Tiffany's asking the question about using somebody else's picture. So, let's say Zarice has a listing. Tiffany is the buyer's agent. She sells that property and she takes Cerise's picture from the MLS and puts pending on it and puts it on her website or wherever. Legally, you can't do that for two reasons. One, because the, the purchase, you, you have not been a party to that sale yet because it's not closed, right? It's pending and you're representing them. The problem is it's not closed yet and you stole the picture that wasn't yours of a property that you don't have listed. So it, the only time legally that you should be posting a picture of a sold property is after it closes, you take the picture or somebody that you have hired takes the picture and you can put sold because now you worked for the buyer and you have the owner's permission. Okay. Zarice has the owner's permission to list the property for sale, but you as XYZ agent over here at the other brokerage, you're taking a picture that doesn't belong to you, and you just used a picture of a house that Sorry you don't actually guys. have the owner's permission. I don't know why the recording stopped, but all right. Yes, do you need me? Yeah, special guest. Right. Yes, Amanda. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I know I can, we can only talk so loud. All right, give me one second here. We're going to share the slides with Mark. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, I'm sorry. I don't know why it is in and out there, buddy. But I'll share the slideshow with you here. Okay, there you go. Let's go back to. Okay. All right. So we covered those listening. Yes, everybody violates that rule. You will see all the time. Like I said, all the things I'm covering with you are things that you're going to go, but everybody does it. I see it all the time. And you're absolutely right. You see it all the time. It doesn't make it right. But if I take a picture of a phone, like do like a final walkthrough and then post a picture of things. After closing, 
yeah, after it's closed. But if you're taking a picture before the final walkthrough or at the final walkthrough and that actually hasn't transferred yet, legally you don't have the owner's permission. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, closing is the, the transfer of the deed in our purchase agreement. So, yeah. So do you have to ask permission for the Right. Yeah. As long as you have that in writing. So the question is, if another legacy group agent doesn't mind me always sharing their listing photos on my own website or Facebook or wherever it is, uh, and you get that in writing from them that you have their written permission to share all of their listings as they come up throughout the year, go for it. Yep. That's okay. You don't need it for every single listing. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the return address that you're using for mailings and where you're sending things. So you mentioned that you're sending out some solicitations for listings in your neighborhood. Um, there are agents that don't work out of this office. They work from home. They work from a different location. Well, there are only three office or four office locations that we actually have um, that are approved. One of them is not on this list because it's cash and we're not sending it to the office for Tracy Jones. She's the only one that works out of her office. So you typically would not use her return address for that office. But there are only four for Legacy Group Realty that are approvable to stay in Ohio. These are the four. We have the Canyon office, we have our Worcester office, and this is our Mansfield office in the middle. So those three office addresses must always be your return address if you are sending out thank you cards that have any solicitations or any information about the brokerage in it. Um, if you're doing anything personally, it doesn't have to. If you're just sending like a personal thank you card to your friend, don't worry about it. Use your personal address. But if it's in there, thanks for buying the house for me. Thanks for working with me. Um, hey, I'm looking at, I have a buyer for your neighborhood. If you have any of that going on, any type of solicitation, you need to use the return address for one of the brokerage addresses. So if you're partnering with, like, for example, I'm partnering with a lender mm -hmm. who is um, not associated with us. And they have a, uh, they can go up and have their return, but we both have our information in there. So I would tell you that you need to use our return address because if you're on there, I don't know what the rules are for lenders. So I can't speak to that. I, I mean, I would say get with your lender and see if they can get with their legal department to see if that's a requirement. For real estate related purposes, if you're sending out a solicitation or an advertisement and you have a return address on there, you cannot use anything but one of the approved real estate office addresses with the state of Ohio. Sorry, just to say that. Yeah. Or anything like that. Anything like that. Okay. Any form of solicitation, advertising, thank you cards, anything that you are sending for your real estate business needs to have this as a return address on. Okay. All right. So let's talk about social media because everybody uses it and everybody loves it and hates it all at the same time. Um, social media has a one click rule. So what does that mean? So when I told you earlier that you have to have your business or, or the uh, brokerage name in all forms of advertising, that is also true for social media. Social media actually does have a one click rule that they have that says, if I post on my business page, for example, and this is, a, this is something that I'll share with you too, it's not on the slide, but my understanding, if you are using a Facebook page and you are advertising your business, you need to have a business Facebook page. Supposedly, if you are caught using your personal page for business promotions, Facebook can shut your account down. I've never seen it happen, but that's what my understanding of this. For your real estate career, you should have a Facebook business page. And when you're advertising, everything you do should be on that Facebook business page. That doesn't mean that you can't share it to your personal page where you have more friends, okay? That's fine. So when I'm scrolling down through Tiffany's page, her personal page, and there's something in there about real estate, if I click on it, it should and it must take me back to a website that has the brokerage name on it. So if she just says Tiffany Winter on her uh, personal Facebook page and she has nothing on there about Keller Williams Legacy for Realty, that's... That's completely okay if you're only using it for personal. If I'm going to put anything business related on there, it must include the name of the brokerage. 
So the safest and best way to do that is to post it on your business page, share it to your personal page. That way, if somebody else shares it, we will always come back to your business page that has our logo and information. Now, it could be something that you're sharing from the MLS. You can uh, share a listing from the MLS. It goes to your personal page. That's okay, as long as when I click on it, it takes me one click and I get back to a website that has the brokerage name listed. Thank you. So if I do like a practice online, they can come from my business page on my personal page. If you if you want to do it on your personal page, you can, but you can't forget to make sure that you have the logo or Keller Williams Legacy Group Realty now on your personal page in that particular post. What if it's like, oh, okay. So what I, I yeah, wow. right. That's how I cover myself on my on my personal page. I have Keller Williams Legacy Group Realty on there too, because that way it's on there, and whenever somebody clicks on something, it's there. I don't, I don't even have to think about it or worry about it. And part of that is because I'm not that tech savvy. And a lot of times when I go to post something, it somehow goes on my personal page instead of my business page. And so that's the way I cover myself. But where do you have it in your personal page? I have it as my cover picture. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. It, it's, my, it's my background picture. So just say I work at NMB when mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. Nope. That's just your bio. Okay. That has nothing to do with. It, with the actual advertising of the brokerage. That's just your bio. Yep. Any other questions about social media? Because it is one of those things where, you know, if you're doing a YouTube channel, you got to make sure that you're saying Keller Williams Legacy Group Realty somewhere in there or it's in your background. It's somewhere in that solicitation that you did. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the MLS because mm -hmm. agents are. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, That's okay. <clears throat> So, if I'm doing like an event and it's like a like a photo booth or something, and I want to put my logo in there, mm -hmm. um, the legacy group logo has to be somewhere on there as well. Yep. Like every picture. Yeah. So the question is, I have a photo booth. I'm at an event, and I am advertising my real estate services because I have Zarice Stevens logo for my real estate business on there, right? On the photo. That is a solicitation or an advertisement for your real estate career, right? Legacy Group Realty has got to be somewhere on there. It's every single form of advertising you can think of. Yeah. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about the MLS. So MLS here at Legacy Group, we are a member of many different MLSs. We have MLS Now, which is our predominant MLS. We have the Ashland MLS. We have Mansfield MLS. And we actually have Columbus, which is Flex MLS. We also have Firelands. We actually have five MLSs that we are part of here. And even though your real estate license allows you to sell anywhere in the state of Ohio, you need to remember you should only be selling in an area in which you actually have knowledge and you're experienced in selling in, as opposed to going to Cincinnati or Columbus. If you aren't familiar with those markets, you're not doing your clients any good at all. In fact, you might accidentally misrepresent them and not intentionally. So you need to always stay in the scope of your knowledge, which means you should be selling in your area. However, if you do decide to get a listing in one of those other areas, just know because your broker is a member of all five of those, you also then have to become a member of that group of that MLS, and you have to list the listing in that MLS. So if you go get a listing in Ashland, you now, Lynette Kelly, have to add yourself as an Ashland member and pay those dues. For the MLS, for I think they have a three month uh, payment, but nonetheless, you would have to add yourself because the brokerage is a member. Okay, so you have to be a part of wherever your broker is a member. Gotcha. If you want to show a property, like I had, you know, in Columbus, and how I can do that because most of them are with Supra and I cannot, you know. Yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about the Supra. So Supra is specific to areas and so mls now area has supra and columbus has supra they're two so totally different systems you can't go to columbus and open a super box with your super key from mls now um, your brokerage is a member of columbus and that's how you get paid so that's one of the things though again when i say going outside of your service area maybe you know columbus really well maybe you know it and you can represent your client very successfully but most agents should not be driving to Columbus. It's a two-hour drive. What 
is it about Columbus? If you're looking just for the money for it, you're going to get yourself in more trouble than you are over one transaction. You're going to lose more money or possibly your license for possibly misrepresenting something. So I would say you should. Well, just to show, I want to show, like if I have family, when I show property there and I went there and like I was able to open that. That's you're not able to open them, right? Yeah. So the so, only you know they need right. to push any type one. I know sometimes you'd have to contact the listing brokerage to see if they would let you in or change they up. Needed that time. Yep. Well, like, that's the only thing you can do. They also have a one-time sales and break procedure. Mm -hmm. You just don't have a, you know, a listing agent has to do that. Okay. But again, if you're going to Columbus and you don't have those tools that you need, then you're going to need to join the Columbus MLS so that you have access to. Okay, I mean, I, I thought maybe it's some kind of help, like you said, one time, or you know, just uh, the listing agent can provide a one time service. Yes. Okay. So I need to contact the listing. Yes, okay. and as long as they will do that, they'll do that. I've noticed something recently where it says, um, that there's a commission, but this is only available to members of now MLS or whatever. Yes. So some of the changes that we'll talk about here on these few slides are going to be NAR is in a lawsuit, if you're not familiar with that. Um, there are two states. It is a class action lawsuit against NAR, REMAX, Keller Williams. Um, and these litigants are alleging that they, they paid too much money for real estate agent services because they paid for the buyer's agent commission as well as the listing agent commission. And before the administration changed for president, we had a signed agreement with the Justice Department with us making changes with our MLS and advertising things in a different manner. One of those things that we agreed to is that we would give the compensation of whatever the buyer's agent was on public facing websites, the MLS. So if you notice on any other website other than the MLS, the consumer has no idea what the commission is that you're getting paid, right? Now they will, and they need to, because that was something that we entered into an agreement with them. The MLS is the contract from one brokerage to pay the other brokerage. So the easiest way to explain this is if you are a member, if your broker is a member of the MLS that you are showing the property in, you're guaranteed to get paid the compensation listed in the MLS. If you drive to Cincinnati and you show a house because we are not a member of that MLS and you do not negotiate a commission with the brokerage before you show that property saying that you're going to get paid, they do not have to pay you. Okay. So again, we are a member of five different MLSs. You're pretty well covered in our marketplace for the most part. Uh, Rick, how many MLSs are you guys affiliated with? Just MLS now. Just MLS now. Okay. So that can be a little bit sticky if you have an agent that's selling somewhere that, you know, Columbus or wherever, because Solon is not terribly, terribly far. I mean, I'm sure you have agents towards the Mansfield -ish area as well. Um, but nonetheless, when you have that crossover, uh, you should be a member of that or your broker should be a member of that. So, the saying that they're, they're talking about there is the listing agent or the listing broker is the one that's actually paying the compensation for the buyer's broker. The seller is not paying the compensation. So even though we put it on a title, um, the title company is great to work with that they say, hey, we're going to collect the commission from the seller and pay it to you directly. In reality, even though the title company is sending that check to us as the brokerage, that money is actually coming from whatever the listing brokerage is. If we are paid from a listing brokerage to the buyer's brokerage. Okay. Now, I went off on a little bit of a backstory there, but what exactly, I want to make sure I answered the question. Yeah, I just noticed that's a new thing that I started mm -hmm. noticing. I don't think it's always been there where it'll say compensation or commission. Or it's like for MLS now. Yeah. So again, because we have to start putting that public facing information out there, the consumer can't think that they're going to get a commission. They have to be a member of MLS now in order for that compensation to be offered. And that was something that we entered into with the Department of Justice. Now, that agreement has been reneged on. The Department of Justice, upon the transfer of the president, they, they took that back, which is, from my understanding, the first time in U.S. history that's ever happened. Um, so we, 
you are in a fight for your career, coach. I will just tell you that, you know, your the way that we've always done real estate may or may not be the way that we do real estate in the future. I can go further off on that, but I would I would tell you get involved with your legislative um, committees at the board and look into RPAC because investing that little bit of money every year goes a long way to help protect you and the consumer. So we'll get off on that tangent because I could stay on that soapbox all day. Go ahead. So as long as you're you're good. So Firelands, MLS Now, Columbus, which is Flex MLS, and Navica, which is Ashland and Mansfield. Are the dues paid for every? No, the dues are not. In fact, we'll get there on the next slide. Sneaking in. No way, sorry. All right. So if you're coming from a different brokerage or you are just a new agent, one of the things here at Legacy Group is you are responsible for your input on your own listings in the MLS. So no matter which MLS you're a part of, we do not have somebody that puts in the listings or photos or anything for you. You are responsible for that. And you're also responsible for your status changes. So a status change means that you're going from active to either under contract, allowed showings, under contract, no showings, or sold. You only have 48 hours to change a status, uh, change from, un, from active to under contract, allowed showings or not allowed showings. And then you only have 14 days to mark a listing as sold. If you don't do it in that time frame, you can be fined from the MLS. Typically, they'll give you a warning first, but you can be fined after that. Okay. So you want to make sure that you make a timely status change. You talk to your admins about that if you have staff. Um, if you're a single agent, you just need to remember that when you accept that listing, you're marking it as active. When you your client accepts that offer, you're either under contract allowed showings or not allowed showings. Okay, so that's what the UCAS and UCNS stand for: under contract, no showings. Now, the no showings or allow showings is not your decision; it's the decision of your client. Do they want showings to be allowed, even though you're under contract? Because maybe they want a backup. I will tell you that the MLS is getting very strict about this. If it is under contract, no showings, that means zero showings, not even you as the listing agent can show the property to a new consumer. During the transaction, if you have the buyers that are under contract that want to go in to measure things 900 times as much as pain, but that might be that you're allowed to do, that's not considered a showing, but you should not be showing that property to any other consumer and neither should any other agent. Okay. So if a deal falls apart and that listing is still marked under contract, no showings, you cannot show it, even though you know it's coming back on the market in two days. If you get caught, you can be fined by the MLS. Okay. All right. So I talked a little bit about the 48-hour rule, the 24-hour rule for public marketing. So NAR back in uh, 2019, November of 2019, in San Francisco, California, when they had uh, the NAR conference, they came up with what they call the clear cooperation agreement. The clear cooperation agreement says that if you publicly market a property in any way, you must have it in the MLS within 24 hours. Okay. It doesn't say 24 business hours, it just says 24 hours. Now, MLS now has a rule where you have 48 hours to input a listing. So if you get a listing technically on a Friday at three o'clock in the afternoon, it doesn't mean that you should be putting in the MLS by Saturday at three o'clock in the afternoon, according to MLS rules. MLS rules give you 48 hours, business hours, which means you actually wouldn't have to put it in until Tuesday. The clear cooperation agreement doesn't say that. The clear cooperation agreement says if you put a sign in the yard, if you put a, a post on Facebook, whatever it is, it should be in the MLS within 24 hours. That's it, 24 hours. It doesn't say business hours, it just says 24 hours. So those agents that are putting a sign in the yard on Tuesday and not putting something in the MLS until Friday are in violation of two rules, the MLS and the, and the 24 hour clear cooperation agreement. Okay. You're gonna find agents that are gonna do this. That doesn't mean that it's right. It just means that they shouldn't be doing it and they're just breaking the rules. Okay. MLS classes are available. We do not teach them here. MLS now will happily come out. They will do a class for you. Um, in fact, we're probably going to have them coming up soon because there are some changes that we went to. Rick and I both attended an MLS class or MLS broker forum this past week, 
um, where there's a bunch of changes on the next slide actually has them. So your timing is good because I think Marcy was asking about those. So timing is good to come in. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the classes. I highly recommend that you take an MLS class because it's great. Don't call me or the staff here at the office and say, I don't know how to put in a new listing because we're not going to walk you through. There are videos and there is a way to do it. Um, if you either take the class, you can self teach by taking, watching the video, or you can actually take a class and they'll help you. Okay. Um, temporarily off market, this is something that we've had in the MLS status, but it hasn't been used often. So one of the things that they're going to start policing is, let's say, for example, you have a client that you want, they want to list their house on Monday, but they really don't want any showings until Friday. Well, unfortunately, you want to secure that listing, right? You want to make sure nobody else is going to come in and swoop in and take that property. So go ahead and list the property for sale, make the active date on that Monday, whatever it is, let's say, for example. And then, unfortunately, you're going to do a status change that says temporarily off market, and you're going to take it off market from probably Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and put it back on a Friday because your seller doesn't want any showings. Okay, so it's gonna be temporarily off market. And when you put something temporarily off market in the broker remarks, you have to put the BOM date, which is back on market date. So if I were doing it on Monday, I'm taking it off the market temporarily because my seller wants no showings. Um, I would put BOM date, whatever that is on Friday, okay? So you need to make sure that if it's longer than 48 hours that a seller doesn't want showings from the date of listing, that you are putting it as temporarily off market. It's not going to happen terribly often, but it, there will be those times it will happen. Okay. So that's one of the things that they're going to really start policing. So that's okay. Because some people, like there's been talk about they're going active, but then there's no showing. Mm -hmm. But that's different because they're not taking it temporarily off market. If it's active, they're just not but, showing. But you're not allowed to do that. That's the whole thing. The temporarily off market. So again, if, if I'm listing a property and it can't be shown in the first 48 hours, the MLS is basically saying, look, we'll look the other way if you list something on Monday and it can't be shown until Wednesday. Okay, we understand the seller doesn't want showing until Wednesday. You better get it in writing from the seller that they don't want showing starting until Wednesday if you're listing it on Monday, or if you're listing it on Friday and they don't want showing until Monday, so get it in writing. Get it in writing. It's their, their decision. But if it's going to be longer than 48 hours and the seller says, I want my house listed for sale, but I don't want showings, you got to temporarily take it off the market. What agents are doing is they're listing a house on Thursday and they're saying that there are no showings until Sunday's open. You can't do that. And the MLS is saying, look, we know we're getting complaints about that. We're going to try and stop this from happening. So if you list a house on Thursday, by Saturday, you better be able to allow showings. You're not doing it until Sunday. So if on Friday, let's say that happens and all of a sudden you can't show it until Sunday at the open house, that's probably going to be a violation because you're doing it on purpose. Um, but if your seller told you no showings for two days, Saturday and Sunday, I don't want my house showing until Monday, you're okay with that. That's okay. But as long as it's 48 hours, put a temporary market. Rick? By the way, this also goes for, sorry. The, no, you're good. Yeah. No, this no, also exactly. goes for uh, in the middle of your listing period. So if you have a listing that's showing now and Memorial Day is coming up, Party, no showings on Memorial Day on that Monday. You can block off that up to 48 hours. So if they got family in for a week and they don't want showings all week long while they're at the company, got to take it off. Under that. Yep. It's not just for a new listing, it's also for true when it's, when it's in. That's right. We haven't seen that lately because market time is like three days. But, but well, here, I've seen on market, but it continues to accumulate while it sits temporarily off. Right. It's still during the listing period. So I imagine that when you put it back on, the cumulative days on market will change. The active days on market probably will not, but I don't know the answer to that 100%. Therese? What if it's like a difficult tenant? Like, could you get in trouble for that? Or so a difficult happen? tenant, they did cover that. And they basically said that they're allowing, if, if it's a tenant occupied duplex or property or whatever, and you, the landlord says, no showings at all until you have a fully executed contract, you're allowed to do that on rental properties. Yeah. But get it in writing from the seller that says that they won't allow showings until you actually have a fully executed purchase. Rate. Here's the thing, like the MLS said, I thought it was really good. John, John Curlich, for those of you that don't know, is our COO for MLS now. He is amazing. Carl Demuse is our CEO. They're both amazing. I mean, they're available to you at any point in time that you need somebody. Um, but 
I thought it was interesting because like Carl or uh, like uh, John said, he said, when you're selling a house, don't you want to see it before you buy it? So the seller's kind of doing themselves a disservice by putting their pro their rental property up for sale, but you can't get in until you actually write an offer because now I don't even know if I'm willing to pay what I offered on the property. So they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot, but it is allowed because they, they know that you can't do that. The other thing is, is an auction foreclosure type situation. Those we're seeing those pop up that you cannot get in to see them. They're allowing that as well because you can't get in. It's occupied by the owner or it's a bank sheriff sale or whatever. So there they are allowing those. I did the same thing like that on a duplex for $950 and we, uh, we put the offer, but just to, you know, if the offer accepted, the fee yeah. sometimes like $20. So yeah. that's what I'm like, you know. And they're allowed to do that. Yeah. Yep. And they're allowed to do that yeah. on a rental property. Yep. All right, let's continue on about the MLS here. So fees for MLS now, every six months, I believe it's February 1st and August 1st, you're gonna get a $228 bill. Those of you that are with uh, the STAR board or ACAR, we are shareholder boards. And so that's why you get that bill directly from the MLS. If you are not with that board, you do not get that bill. You get that bill from your pool. So if you're with Wayne Homes Association, if you're with, um, a different association, a Mansfield or whatever, you're going to get that bill from somebody else. Not from the MLS. Now it's coming from the actual, um, your association that you're affiliated with. So fees for uh, Mansfield and Ashland, again, those are billed to the brokerage. So if you are a member of Ma uh, Mansfield or Ashland, we get the bill and then we add it to your agent bill monthly. So you will, your bill will go from 4750 that you're paying to the brokerage. It will be increased, whatever that fee is. So when Nick gets that bill once a month, he adds it to yours and we bill it to you. You owe that to us because we're paying that up front. Okay. For Mansfield and Ashland, they also charge a fee for an IDX feed. And so I think that's $50 a year, or $50 a month. I really can't remember which one it is, but I can tell you that if you are a primary member of one of those boards or one of those uh, MLSs, and you want an IDX fee from there, they do charge monthly, yearly fee for that. Okay. Uh, Columbus Flex MLS, that's annual. Boy, that was uh, pretty crazy. I want to say that bill was like $749 for the year for their MLS dues, the board dues, super dues, all of their stuff that they have down in Columbus. It was super expensive. So, but that's billed once a year in December, and that's billed for the entire next year. So, um, MLS now does include your super access. So we kind of talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, in MLS now, you must have at least one photo in unless it's vacant land. If it's a commercial property, if it's a rental property, any kind of duplex property, it doesn't matter. If it's anything other than vacant land, you must at least have one photo in or you can be fined by the MLS. Okay. So make sure and it's got to be an exterior front photo. So it's supposed to be not a photo of a kitchen, not a photo of a closet or a bathroom or anything like that. If they just redid, it has to be a front exterior photo. What's that little default word photo? Like, how do they get away with that? Because you have 48 hours to put in your picture. Okay. So, so that's why you're seeing that little brick <laughs> default photo. But you have 48 hours to put one. And they'll warn you and they'll tell you, listen, you haven't done this, get it in. But you, you need to just, so you know, take a picture, get it in there. Right. And, and here's the thing, too. If you're listing a property, at least in my experience, I don't even put it active until I have my photos in there because photos are what get people in the door. So while you're listing a property and marking it active before the photos have caught up, I don't, I don't understand that, to be honest. So, and, and one photo could get somebody in the house, but typically in our experience, for those of you that have been in real estate for a while, if there are no interior photos of a property, there's a reason. So, yeah. Um, and one of the other things that came out of this uh, lawsuit with the Department of Justice and NAR is a buyer's agent cannot offer or advertise their services as free. And this is something that the MLS is, is telling you now too. So often, because like I just explained to you that the other brokerage pays a buyer's agent commission, you had agents that were going around saying, it's free. You can use me and it's completely free as a buyer's agent. It's not free. First of all, if this brokerage is charging a $225 additional commission fee to that client, but secondly, you are getting paid from the buyer's broker or the listing broker, I'm sorry. So, so you're, you're not, it's not free. And that is another reason why the compensation is now on all public facing websites that the MLS goes out to. So, 
Okay. So you cannot say that your services are free. Now, for a listing, you could say your CMA is free. You can still do that. Like you can say that, you know, that is free. But once you are working on the buy side, your services are not free. Okay. Could you just say you don't have to pay a commission from the listing agent or the listing agent? But they, but they all, but they are. They, they're paying a two hundred twenty-five dollar additional commission fee at the brokerage, and most brokerages do have that. And so I don't know how you would say. I mean, could you just say the bulk of the premium is not going to be that I don't, I don't know that I would want to test that. I'm going to tell you now with with the lawsuits that are going on. I don't want to be the one to test that. And I prefer that our brokerage doesn't be the one to test that. Um, so. There's really no reason for a real estate agent to advertise their services as free anyway, because first of all, we're worth the commission that we make, and we're worth the commission that we charge. And with inflation and everything else, when you fill up your car and then drive around and show 15 houses that you lose an offer on, and then try and say that you're not worth the justification of what you're getting paid, it's just not worth it. So there's no reason that an agent should ever have to say that their services are free because you pay for everything. I mean, and let's put it this way: I mean, even an Uber ride. Tipping somebody, you get a cup of coffee, you're tipping somebody. Like they're, you're paying for services no matter where you go in this world. We are no different. We need to show our value rather than reduce our commission or say that we're free. So that's what I would say. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, our information here. So we haven't seen it in a while, but there are HUD homes that are still sold. For those of you that don't know, the federal government repossesses property that they have FHA and VA loans on. And um, no, we haven't seen those in a while. You will start to see those come back and it'll be at hudhomestore.com is the website. And for those, we have an NEIB number. This is the NEIB number. You will need that when you register on that website with our brokerage. If you have registered on that website before and you are a new agent here, um, but you were at a previous brokerage, you need to make sure you go in and you update this NEIB number or you will not be able to make a bid on a property under this brokerage. And this is something that you do on your side, this is not something that the brokerage does. So this information is available in um, dot loop under office information, but it is important for you to have because when you need it, you're going to frantically look for it and not have it. Right? So make sure that you have that. Our office license number for Keller Williams Legacy Group is 2007-005231. You don't often need that, but sometimes for referrals, you might need that information, but that is our actual office. License number for the division of real estate separate from my license number. That is not mine, but that is separate. And that is because we were actually formed in 2007. So the EIN number, so our employer identification number is there. In case you need that for referrals, you need the W9 form. That is in dot loop. All of that is available to you. The W9 form is there. MLS now broker ID for the Canton office is the C75759. Now, why is that important? If you're already registered with our office under that, um, when you input the listings, you don't have to choose one. But for admins, we have to choose which office we're affiliated with. And so we also made sure that Mansfield, Worcester, and Ashland all have an office ID so that that way people aren't coming, sending earnest money checks to us that need to go to an agent in another office. So we do have three office IDs. And then again, I said it's in that loop. Um, if you haven't heard of your NERDS number yet, that's the National Realtor Database System. That changed on January 1. It is no longer called NERDS. It is now called M1. So you all have an M1 number. And that M1 number or NERDS number, uh, you will need when you register for NAR classes, designations. Um, and you can also go on the NAR website and get discounts on rental cars and different things that your, your membership includes. And you will probably need your M1 number. So just know you're, you're, you're no longer a nerd. Why? Why do you change it? I don't know. They, they got away from being a nerd. So nope. we're, we're M1 now. I don't think your number changed, but it's changed to M1. Yeah. So just so you know. And again, each agent has a number. All right. Let's talk a little bit about commissions and how you guys all want to get paid because that's super important. The first thing to do is you should never be talking about commission with anybody that is not in your brokerage. You should never be at another brokerage or your friend is out talking about how we should all fix the commission rates to be X percent or whatever. And you should never answer the question, well, that brokerage charges X. You should never say the words in a listing appointment. Well, the standard in our area is charging X. 
I'm below that or above that. You should never, ever, ever talk about commission with your consumer other than to say at Keller Williams Legacy Group, we charge blank. That's the only thing that you're legally, I don't know if that's me. Is that you? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're Sorry, we heard this beeping happening. I wasn't sure what's going on. Like my computer's doing. All right. So antitrust laws, you cannot talk about commission. So um, again, you can't say in our area the general commission is six percent. If somebody calls you and says, "Well, what do you charge for commission?" You can say what you charge. If it's six percent, seven percent, whatever it is. In our purchase or our listing agreement, it's seven percent. So you should always try and get seven percent because you're worth it. Again, um, I think that we've seen. In our brokerage, we have seen that it has dropped. It is 6%, and I've even seen 5% many times, depending upon the price of the home. Um, it can be argued all kinds of different ways. The home price has gone up, so we should be charging less. Um, it can be argued that inflation has gone up, so we, we're worth our money, but basically 7% is what you should be charging in this brokerage. The great thing is you don't have to ask me if you want to reduce it to 6% or 5%. You can do that on your own. That's a great thing. Um, I know Linda and I, back when we were at the Realty One days, if you did anything other than a 7%, you had to go to the office manager and get approval for it. So um, I'm sure that's still true at some other brokerages, but you know, this is your business and we want you to be competitive and be able to get, get what you're um, worth. So if you can charge 10%, go for it, but <laughs> charge it. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the Cobro. Uh, Cobro, we actually, and I put this in there because believe it or not, we had one agent that was a new agent. I don't even remember who it was now. I don't even know if they're here. We have one agent and they put in their new listing in the MLS and they took a listing for 3% is what they put in the listing agreement. And they gave away 3% in the MLS. And they didn't realize that they were supposed to be charging X percent, like six or seven or whatever, and then giving away half of that to the buyer's brokerage. And so unfortunately we had to go back to that seller and try and renegotiate because the seller thought, hey, I'm getting a great deal here, 3% commission. Um, and so unfortunately that agent walked away with very, very little money. So I say that because when you see the compensation in the MLS, whether it says it's a 3%, maybe it's 3% on the first 100,000, 2% on the balance, or it's 2.5%, whatever it is, what's in the MLS is what the buyer's brokerage is getting. That is not what you actually are charging the consumer. <coughs> MLS is your contract. We talked about that a little bit ago, so I'm not going to go into that again. So we have two things. Um, those of you that have been here for a while have green sheets. Green sheets are in the KW um, internet site, and that's how you get paid. We need to do the green sheet. You need to submit that a minimum of a week before your closing, because that's how we know to go in and do your compliance to make sure that your file has everything in it that's supposed to. Otherwise, what's going to happen is your check is going to come in, it's going to sit here because you don't have compliance done or you haven't done a green sheet and then it's going to take a week to get you paid and you're going to be very annoyed and that's been happening lately. Unfortunately, we can't control that because we don't know that you have a sale until you actually tell us which is the green sheet. And for those of you that have been here less than probably a year or about a year, you're going to be doing this in command. You're not even using the green sheet. So I will tell you, so Keller Williams Living and Keller Williams Elevate, they do everything 100% in command. Both their compliance and their uh, commissions. So it's pretty crazy. We're actually in a leadership here because we don't like to rock the boat. We were trying to keep you guys all from getting all on the command platform, but we're slowly going to it. You're all going to be kicking, screaming, and crying, but we're not going to have a choice because eventually green sheets are going away. And we and that's just KWRI. So for now, those of you that are doing green sheets, great. Keep those up. Those of you that are doing command, put it in there, but you need to make sure you're doing that about a week at a minimum before closing. That's how you get paid. You're not going to get paid if you don't do it. So. I'll say, with, I never personally trained on green sheets, but command is really not hard. Command is super easy for green. Where is, uh, where is the bank? In the commissions tab. But you, have, you have to go into the actual client, and then you go through it that way. Lynn is too. I yeah. would say that, but it's a super easy concept. Yeah, Lynn, Lynn can take care of, of that. For you. you, you can set up a one on one with Lynn and she can walk you through it, or you can come to one of her classes. But yep, she'll walk you through that. Oh, we're not changing anything yet, just so you know. I'm just telling you that at some point that's coming. So, Marcy, get ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you have required forms that you have to have. And I say that because, again, a compliance, if you don't have the required compliance forms that we're required to have for the state in order to pay you, 
you're not getting paid. So again, unfortunately, you can kick, scream, and cry, but if you haven't done what you have to do in order to be compliant for us, we cannot pay you. Okay. Um, the 225 additional commission. So as it stands right now, if you're on a 70-30 plan, you actually get $75 of that 225 back in your commission. If you are on an 80-20 plan, you do not get any of that back that comes to the brokerage. Um, and so with that, if you don't charge it, you will be charged it in your commission. So if you do not charge the consumer the additional 225, we will take it out of you. Um, and I, I'll be honest, that is the difference between us being profitable and not. I mean, that is honestly what pays the rent, keeps the lights on, and keeps the profit share checks where they where you want them to be. Without that, profit share checks would not be anywhere near what they are to be. Just so uh, the caveat to that is the 225 only has to be charged to the consumer twice in one year. So if you're working with an investor, the first two sales, 225 gets charged. After that, you do not have to charge it. What you do have to do is email Nick and let him know that you will not be collecting that and don't take it out of you because we would have no idea that you're charging it on that third time or not charging it rather on that third time. And that's in the calendar year. So January through December. Yeah. It is way for VA. VA, you cannot charge it. That's right. I'm sorry. Well, it's in your purchase agreement. It's in your purchase agreement and it's in your listing agreement that the consumer is agreeing to pay it. And if you're doing your escrow instructions, it's on there. And, and when we get to the escrow instructions, which is coming up, I will explain what I think we should all be doing in order to make sure that we're compliant with that, but also for the client. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody's paying it for you. So Zarif is over here saying, I think I'm I think I'm paying myself. So, uh, I did one. Uh, yeah. Well, I paid. It, it, it say anything to that. Yep. Nope. It happens. So um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about showing time. So you are charged seven dollars and fifty cents a month here at KWLG for showing time. That gives you full access. That means agents can call in and set up showing on showing time. Um, you can call in. Um, showing time is available to agents that are a part of MLS now, whether you're with our brokers or not, they just don't have the full version of it. So all that they can do is an agent can click on, I want to schedule a showing, it will email the client or whatever, but there's no phone communication whatsoever. And a lot of the other services for reports, they don't get either. Okay. So you have access to this pool, which is great for $7.50 a month. So uh, listings are entered. Automatically, when you put the listing in MLS, it automatically ports over to ML uh, to showing time, and so you can go in showing time then and give it about 10 to 15 minutes after you enter the listing in MLS, and you can set up showing instructions for your client. Now, the great thing is, this is once you set it up, it kind of forget it. You know, Nick, you set it up, set it, and forget it over that infomercial, whatever that guy was doing that, the cookery thing. So, um, set it and forget it. So. It will email your client the feedback if that's how you set it up when an agent has to give him or fill out the feedback form, which we'll go over in a little bit here. Um, you can block out times if the seller doesn't want showing, but the seller says, look, I work midnight and from eight to noon, I don't want showing. Block those out, that's totally okay. Then your seller doesn't have to worry about getting calls during that time or showing, and you don't have to worry about them. Nope, my seller won't accept showing during that time. It will all be taken care of in the app for you or online. Um, the showing reports, it's great. Again, market time right now hasn't been very long, but I mean, I remember the days where like four months was could be the average market time in a neighborhood. And the client, you know, every week you're sending them a showing report to let them know how many showings they had and what the feedback was so that, that you're keeping engaged with them. Uh, the, for showings, they will text, email, or do a phone call. So however your client likes to be contacted, if they, if they want all three, they can be all three. Um, you can set it up as a go and show if it's a vacant property and just email the client, text the client, and text you, email you, let you know there's going to be a showing on the property. If there's an appointment required, showing time will call them and set that up or text and set that up. You don't have to do anything. You can be um, out on other appointments. And again, it's $7.50 a month, no matter which board you're with. So if you're with Ashland, Mansfield, MLS Now, Columbus, or Ireland, all of them with the exception of Ashland, all of them. All right, uh, who signed the listing or a purchase agreement? So let's talk a little bit about 
If the person is single, when you go out to list the property for sale, you need to ask the question, are you married? It's in the listing agreement. If they are married, remember, this is 2022. They could be married to a woman, could be married to another woman, a man, a man, whatever. Could be seen, probably a dog, who knows? Um, <laughs> I mean, you're allowed to be, you know, wh whatever. If you're married, you're married. And so, therefore, a single person is the only person that has to sign if they are not married. But if they are married, you have to have the spouse's signature on the listing agreement. Why? Because Ohio is the, one of the last three states that has dower rights. And legally, there is nothing in the state statute that says that you must get the spouse's signature on the listing agreement or the purchase agreement. The reason I'm telling you that at this brokerage you want to do that is because if you don't, let, I'll give you an example. I'm married. You come to my house. I take off my wedding ring. I set it down. I want to sell my house and I want to get away from my wife. And I'm going to list my property for sale and I'm going to move out of state. And I'm never going to be seen again. I ask you to come over. You list my property for sale. I tell you I don't want to sign in the yard. And you don't ask why I don't want to sign in the yard, but you advertise my property for sale. You start showing it, accept an offer on the property. I sign it. I get all the way to the closing table, and the title company says, your wife has to come in and sign. And I say, she didn't know that I was selling the house. I don't want her to know I'm selling the house. I'm taking the money and moving to Arizona. And they're going to say, you can't do that. That You now have to have your wife's signature. And you are going to have to then explain to the buyer, the buyer's agent, and all of the money that they spent on why you listed the property that you legally couldn't sell. Okay? Yes. What if you are separated from someone? They live in a completely different state. It doesn't matter. I had clients that had a wife that was in prison. We had to send a prison notary to get her to sign a closing. And if they don't sign, then they don't. They're not selling. I love the questions that the agents are always like, but well, what if? But what if? And I'm terrible. There's no, there's no what if in the world. Like, that's just the way it goes. So, I mean, it's, um, but it's funny because I get the same thing with this one. But what if you did this? Because you could be like legally separated from someone but not divorced, right? It's just a marriage. It's just a marriage. It's the same thing when they buy. If they still, I mean, not divorced, separate. The other person cannot buy by themselves. A oh, buyer yeah. can. If you're married, it takes one to buy and two to sell. You know, but like I, I remember when I asked once because they he wanted just a house to get a his name, but since they're not separated, they need to have that stuff. Okay, so you're telling me probably a little bit different situation. So what she's saying is, is let's say for example, I am maybe in the process of getting divorced and I am still legally married. And this you will run into this in your career. It's gonna happen. You're going to inevitably meet a client that's going to say, I'm in the process of getting divorced, or my spouse doesn't know that I'm filing for divorce next week. I want to buy a house so I have a place to go. Well, guess what? If they close on that house while they're still legally married, that other spouse that they want to get away from has dower interest in that property, and it is now considered an asset of the marriage. Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure that you know that because unless somebody is legally divorced, signed, sealed, and delivered, if they are married and they buy a property, it only takes one to buy, but now they both own it, even if there's only one on the deed. Okay, so that's super important when you're on a listing appointment to make sure you understand. I have uh, friends that uh, two men that are married and they use a different agent. There's, I mean, everybody knows a real estate agent, right? So they use another real estate agent that we all know very well. And unfortunately, the title company or the agent ever asked if they were married, and only one of those parties signed off on it. And I said, Well, that's good for you, but I can tell you now, in the future, there's going to be a problem if it ever comes back on title because you didn't both sign off on it. So, again, whether it's two men, two women, doesn't matter. It is a marriage license is marriage license. Right? What about if you don't have both spouses? Like, so let's say the person's single, they own a house, they get married. So now that life is attached. So you're going to list it and you have the person who owned it originally signed everything. But when they get to the closing table, the wife signs. She does. But again, I'm telling you as the broker here, you should be getting the spouse's signature. Not like, oh, I have this power. I'm just telling you, like, I'm relieving us of the liability. I'm telling you, get their signature because when that happens and the new wife says, or spouse, whatever it says, I don't want to sell this house or I'm not signing anything because now I'm mad at you today. <laughs> that's going to be a problem. Okay, but only if it truly is like that. I mean, if they're in agreement, it's going to be fine. If she 
Yeah. Oh, but but wait, oh, but next, everybody question. signs a purchase agreement that says if we don't do this, I'm I agree to sign a mutual release. It's in a purchase agreement like two or three times. You mean they don't sign it when they're mad? No, they don't. So no, you okay, can't. Does she also have to sign the residential property? She should be signing everything. If she's lived in the house and she's married to that person, she should have knowledge of what's going on. I have a question on the other side of these that says, you know, money to buy. Yep. So if the uh, sometimes get um, lender approval letters yep. that have both names on them, but only they only want one person to sign, and they're telling me my name shouldn't be on there. Yep. So I'm just having the one person. Does it matter? Listen to the lender. The lender has the money, they have the power, and that's okay. But in the letter, they put both names. Well, they should and probably they should probably take the other name off. Yeah, yeah. If you only want one, if the lender only wants one name on the purchase agreement, there should only be one name on on the actual pre. Yeah. Okay. Now, some things can happen where you have two spouses, you have a spouse, and they are both on the pre-approval letter. They're both on the purchase agreement, and then all of a sudden, one of them misses their car payment. The lender says you got to take somebody off there. You do an addendum and you take them off and remove it. So things can happen with that. Again, it just takes one to buy and two to sell. So that's what you have to remember is I can go buy a house without my spouse knowing it. The, the problem is they're going to become an owner the, the minute that I sign the papers. I can't sell it without their signature. And I think that the purchase As long as the lender allows it, sometimes they won't. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Um, we just had a trust class. How was that class? So I think you you were in it, Marcy. How was it? Our attorney taught. Oh, I thought it was good. Good for those of you that were in it. So Jamie is great. Um, Jamie is a part of our attorney group that represents us here, but also at the board. Um, and she taught that trust class. So you know who is the trustee? I'm not going to go over too much of that, but what documents are needed? Just know that if you go out and I have the Rich Cosgrove Living Trust, and my house is in that trust, you as the agent should be getting a copy of those trust documents reading through there to find out who is able to sign to sell this real estate. Maybe my trust says that me and my spouse have to sell in order or have to sign in order to sell through the trust. Maybe you have an LLC document where there's three partners. Only one has to sign. Maybe only one has the power to, to sell. Maybe three have to sign for real estate. You don't know. So you need to always get documentation from whatever entity it is that you are listing the property in. Marcy? Because I know sometimes people bring me the whole book. Oh, yeah. And we don't want the whole book. And we, yeah, we you don't need. Don't yeah, you don't need the articles of incorporation. You don't need all that stuff. Basically, all you're looking for is in the operating agreement. You just need the real estate section in the operating agreement. That's what you need. Rick? If, if you're the listing agent and your buyer comes purchasing in a trust, how do you verify that that John Doe signing? That purchase agreement is in fact the trustee, or if their spouse also needs to sign, you know, how do you verify that as a listing agent? Exactly. Well, as a listing agent, I would ask for the trust documents before I listed the property for sale because I need to know who actually has the legal right to sell the property. Um, it could be the Rich Cosgrove Living Trust, and maybe I'm not even a trustee, maybe my spouse is the trustee. And you just assume as a listing agent that I am because it's my name and you let me sign as a member. That would not be appropriate. So I would put that blame on the listing agent to say, you should ask for those documents. You need to know who your client is and who actually can sign. But if I'm a buyer's agent and you ask me for that, I might say, it's none of your business. It's a private trust document for my client. If I were a buyer's agent, I would not be asking the listing agent for that trust documentation. No. What about no, if you're no, the listing saying, agent? You as the listing agent here, who can sign to the buyer? If the buyer is a trustee, if if the buyer is a trustee, no, I would hope that the agent on the other side of that transaction is doing their job appropriately. So that's what that's what I was asking. If you're yeah. a listing agent and the purchaser is purchasing the trust, how do you know that? The title, ultimately the title company will ask for it, but you as the buyer's agent should be asking for it as well to say, okay, this is. <laughs> I don't know, John Doe LLC, 
and you're John Doe, but I need a copy of your LLC documents. Are you able to purchase real estate under your agreement or are there three people that need to sign under this agreement? As the agent, that's why I bring this up. You need to know who your client is and who legally has the right to sign, whether it's a buyer or a seller. But to your point, if you don't ask for it, if you're just completely naive and don't ask for it on the list side or the buy side, just know that when it gets to the title company, they are going to require those documents. And even a power of attorney, let's say, for example, some people don't realize a power of attorney dies with this person. So if I, if somebody has a power of attorney for me and I die, guess what? The power of attorney just died too. Um, some people don't know that. And some people in a family might go, oh, well, I was my dad's power of attorney. He passed away, but I can still list a house for sale. No, you can't. Alive, but not after they're dead. Right. That's an executor. So you have, that's why I bring this up for, for estate sales, trust, anything like that. You have to know who is able to legally sign on behalf of selling that property. Does that help answer the question? Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's difficult because most agents don't do it. Well, I, I just have one of my agents ask me that. They're the listing agent. The purchaser is a trust. And she said, how do I know? And so I can ask for it, but if I'm the buyer's agent, I'm, not I'm probably not giving it to you. Yeah. So just make sure they call the title check for the next 30 days until yep. you figure it out, right? Yeah. <laughs> we have each place they get it right away. I mean, each place. Yeah. They get it immediately. They don't yeah. have. So the question for those of you in Zoom, I don't know if you could hear or not, but it was just basically, um, if you are the listing agent and a buyer is an LLC or a trust or whatever, how can you verify that they have the right person signing? And the, the answer, unfortunately, is you have to trust the buyer's agent that they really are doing what they're supposed to do and get those documents. Because again, the title company is going to need them for it. So, and I can tell you this too, just because a, a, a person has bought something. So, I mean, I'm a prime example. I am a one-man band LLC. I did not have an operating agreement when I started it because I thought, what do I need it for? Well, then I started to purchase real estate in the LLC and the first title company let me close on the property without an operating agreement. I went to do it the second time. They're like, hey, where's your operating agreement? I'm like, I don't have one. Well, the last company let me do it. Nope, we got to have an operating agreement. So legally, you should have an operating agreement even if you're a one-man band and the legitimate title companies will require that just like we're talking about to make sure that I am able to sell it just because it's Cosgrove sales LLC doesn't mean that Rich Cosgrove is the person that's able to sign. So, yeah. All right. Um, so we kind of, we covered divorce, dower rights. We covered all of that. Um, they are looking at abolishing dower rights in Ohio, but it hasn't happened yet. So we're going to deal with it for a while. Um, escrow letters. So this is where, Zaris, you asked the question, how can I verify that the 225 is getting charged? Well, this is one place that you can put it in. So I had one agent from, I think it was the Mansfield area, and I can't remember who it was, and they said, I've never done an escrow letter, and I've been in business for six years. And I said, how have you been getting paid from title companies? I've done, escrow letters have been done since I got into business in 2002. Who knows how long before that? So an escrow letter is, uh, it's a form, and it is in that root, and it is your letter on how you are getting paid in this brokerage on behalf of the consumer. So are you representing the seller? Are you representing the buyer? Uh, is the seller paying closing costs on behalf of the buyer? Did you have a well and septic inspection that you need to worry about paying? Is there a pest inspection that needs to be paid? That form, as a buyer's agent or a listing agent, you should be filling out and sending that to the title company. Okay? And on that form, it lists our 225 additional commission fee, and it asks what is your commission that you believe that you are supposed to receive at value from the broker's standpoint. So that's the first thing it would cover um, the co-broker agent information as well. So the title company knows, hey, who's the person on the other side of the transaction, right? And with that being said, then I say, I don't go that further. I don't know of any agent, well, I take that back. I know plenty of agents that don't. I don't know why there's any agent that does not ask the title company for a copy of the settlement statement before their client signs. I don't know why you would not be reviewing the settlement statement for your buyer or seller to make sure that all of these things are actually on there and the 225 additional commission fee is on there, but also making sure that we're not missing a pest inspection that's supposed to be paid by the seller or a home warranty that's supposed to be paid by the seller on behalf of your client. It's not just about your additional commission or what you're paid. It's about what the consumer is getting on the contract. What were they entitled to per, on the purchase agreement? So you should be doing the escrow letter on every single sale and you should be sending that to the title company. Any questions? 
Yeah, could be repaired, could be anything. Roof repairs, could be a hot water tank had to be installed and someone agreed to pay it. And there's an open invoice. You want to make sure that all of that is taken care of. Yep. Okay. Uh, choosing a title company, we only have uh, kind of seven, eight more slides here. I'll try and speed it up here. Um, choosing a title company, it is negotiable. It's 100% negotiable. Yeah, I, I've heard stories that it's the seller's choice. It's the buyer's choice. Well, in this area, it's the, this realtor's choice. It is not. Respa says it is 100% negotiable between the buyer and the seller. I don't care if you have an ADA, not an ADA, it doesn't matter. It is up to the consumer on what title company you use. If you are affiliated with Stonegate Title Agency, we are here at Keller Williams. If your client is using Stonegate Title Agency and they are a client of Keller Williams, you must have them sign an ADA that is in document. They will not start to try to work about it. You don't need the other client's signature, but you need our client's signature. So if you're representing the buyer, our buyer needs to sign it if you're using Stonegate. If you're not using Stonegate, you don't have to sign it. Okay. But if you're using Stonegate and you're on the listing side, the listing consumer has to sign it, okay? It's only great if you can get the other party signature on it too. Don't fight over it, it's not worth it. Inevitably, you will get a person from another broker that says, my client doesn't have to sign it, and they're absolutely right. So it's up to you if you want to try and get their signature on it. I never had a problem. If my consumer is using whatever title company it is, and I'm not affiliated with them, I still get them to sign the ADA from the other party because they're using the company. I want them to know what's, what's happening. So again, not required. Um, if a seller is paying buyer closing costs, the seller actually has the choice according to RESPA because it's whoever is paying for the title insurance policy. The title insurance policy is the most expensive piece of that. And so if I'm a seller and I'm paying the buyer's closing cost of $4,000, I can pick the title company because I'm paying all the fees. The buyer's not paying any of the fees. I'm paying 100% of mine and the buyer's. I can choose that. Now, I tell that to you, but again, don't lose a deal over a title company. It is not worth it. It just isn't. Um, try and get the business as much as you can. Let the consumer choose. Um, so I talked about you know, the kind of old school rules, and again, don't lose a deal over it. Are there any questions about title company or ABAs? I've seen the format. It says not ADA. Yeah. It's just... Is that required? Or what? It is not required, but Stonegate does have a form in dot root now that if you are not affiliated with Stonegate, meaning that you're not an investor in Stonegate Title Agency, that there is a, a non-ADA disclosure in there and you can get it signed. It's uploaded, it's in there. We are not requiring that it get signed. Uh, I have not been briefed on why that's there, but nonetheless, it is available. So it's just one more form to get signed and nobody wants to do it. So, Nope. I've still never heard of any of like a different title agency. Do I still have to fill out an APA? No. If you're using any other title agency other than the Stonegate, you do not have to have our consumer sign the All right. Home warranty. We are affiliated with America's preferred home warranty. We also have 210 home warranty. Those of you that are in Ashland and Mansfield, they do not service that area as far as 210. I think there is another uh, home warranty company over that way. Um, it is your job as the agent to register the warranty. So if you are buying, uh, if you're representing a buyer and you're writing a home warranty, you need to go on the 210 website or the America Preferred website and register that warranty. Now, for registering the warranty, you get absolutely nothing and you shouldn't get anything simply because um, we cannot be paid in order to refer business to a title company, or um, I'm sorry, a, a home warranty company or any other company for that matter, can't get paid on that referral. Now, you can get paid either $100 from America's Preferred or $75 from 210 by getting the data collection sheet filled out. The data collection sheet is under the warranty tab in dot loop. It's for both 210 and America's Preferred. You can, whichever one you use, you need that form. Um, you're going to write down what brand is the refrigerator. If you can find the make or model number, write it down. You're going to upload that and send it into whichever company you're using, and it's on the form, the email address, or you can do it on their website. If you fill that data collection sheet out and the warranty is paid for at closing or before closing, you within the next three months will get a check from America's Preferred Home Warranty or 210. It will come here and we will get it paid to you. Okay. You must, must, must have the warranty contract or waiver signed for every single transaction you do. 
I know that it's in the purchase agreement and the listing agreement that says that the consumer does or does not want a warranty. The problem is you fill that out as the agent. What's happening is you need to treat every consumer the same. Just because I'm buying a $40,000 fixer upper doesn't mean I may not have the $400 for a home warranty or that the seller won't pay it for me. So you decided not to offer the home warranty. You just automatically check the box no on the purchase agreement. That's discrimination. I know it's not a protected class of discrimination, but it's discrimination. You have to teach or treat everybody the same. Just because somebody's buying a $500,000 house, you can't assume that they have the money and don't want the warranty. And just check the box no. You need to gain the waiver or acceptance form that's completed by the client, which means that it's page 11 of the actual contract for 210 America's preferred, or it's a single form in that loop that is a waiver or acceptance. You can use either three, it doesn't matter. Whichever one, but for every consumer, you have to have that. Okay. It's part of your compliance. Uh, let's talk about the consumer guide quickly. The consumer guide must be signed at the very first opportunity that you have when you meet with the client. So when I go out to a house, you, I take two copies with me. It's front and back. Our consumer guide is different for every company. So if you're here, you're using our consumer guide. The consumer guide explains how agency works here. Uh, we offer, we allow you to have dual agency. Living does not have dual agency. Is that correct? Correct. You cannot be a dual agent with their broker. So their consumer guide is completely different than ours. Um, Everybody's a different broker, but it's different. So uh, you need to make sure that when you first meet with the client, you are getting their signature on that form and you are giving a copy of what they signed. If you don't get their signature or you don't give a copy of what they just signed, you're breaking licensing rules. Okay. I know it can be difficult sometimes as a new agent to ask a client to sign something that they've never met you before and they don't know who you are. If they say, I refuse to sign it, that's fine. Ask them to put in their own handwriting, refuse to sign, and date it. If they won't even do that, you put who you met with, refuse to sign, the address of the property, the date and time, and write it on there and keep that. You need to keep these in your file for three years. Even if you never, ever see that consumer again and you never write an offer on a property for them, you only meet them one time. You need to keep that for three years because if the division walks in and says, I need to see your files because there's a complaint about something else. If they bought a house with somebody else a year ago or a year later and they're backtracking the file and you don't have it, you can be in violation. Okay, so you need to make sure that you have that. Um, it is signed per client, not the number of times you show them a property. So if you show them 10 properties, you still only need one, um, but you need to make sure that you get that signed. And it should be signed before you ever discuss financial anything with them. Okay, so if you have an out of state person in California and they call you and say, hey, I'd love to buy a house in Ohio and I want to talk about financing, you should say, well, allow me to send you the consumer guide, sign it electronically, and then we can talk. Okay. And the other thing is, too, is this helps with procuring cause cases with everybody stepping over one another today. I can tell you right now, I get calls at least once a month on this where one of our agents calls and says, I showed this house to this consumer. I've been working with them for three months. Um, they bought the house with another agent, and I want my money. And the first question I ask them is, did you have them sign a consumer guide? And when they say no, I tell them I can't help you because there's nothing I can do. And that's true. Because if you have, it's, it's kind of like going into court, the doctrine of clean hands. If you go into the division without clean hands, you're not going to get in. Sorry. Um, how far can you talk about finances for your person so far? I mean, you can talk about getting pre-approved and sending them somewhere. Okay. If you're talking about specifics with their down payment and what they're looking to spend, um, you should be having a consumer guide sign. So... Because we're only we're not allowed to talk about everything in finances, right? Because that's the lender has to. Like, yeah, but if I'm talking to a buyer and they say I want to buy a three hundred thousand dollar house, and I start saying to them I'm pre-approved, and they'll say no, I say well, let's just the lender and get pre-approved. That's one thing. But if I start saying how much money are you going to put down? What are you looking for as far as uh, you know property taxes? What do you want the house payments in order? I'm qualifying you. You know, once a day, believe it or not, back in the day where we had real estate agents had a formula, we actually qualified buyers. When we met with them, and we say, Where do you want your house payment to be? And we had a calculator and we could do it. And we'd be like, Oh, well, I can show you a $130,000 house as long as the taxes are this. We don't do that anymore, but we had an opportunity when we did. Um, but before you talk about their financing, what they're putting down, um, how much money they're looking to spend, all of that, you really should have consumer debt. Yeah. Yes. Um, so when you're working with a client and let's say a grandparent comes to work 
Yep. So do you have the grandparents as well as the grandson's side or just the grandparents and the same side? Right. So the question is if I'm working, if I have a grandparent and I have a grandson or grandchild, whatever, and the grandchild is really the one that's actually getting the house, the grandparents are the one paying for it, the grandparents are your client. That's who has the money. That's who should be signing the consumer guide. They can do whatever they want with the house after you close on it. They can quick claim deed it. They can do whatever. But the person that has the money is the client. If you, if, if I receive, and this just happened this week, actually, uh, to one of our other agents, if I receive a purchase offer from Marcy that said that Rick is buying this property, but his cousin Zarice is giving him the cash. I don't care about Rick, sadly. I want Zarice signing the purchase agreement because Zarice has the money. If Rick doesn't buy the house, I can't go after Zarice because Zarice is loaning him the money. So Marcy should be giving Zarice's signature and Zarice's consumer guide and everything, not Rick's. But who's mm -hmm. going to be in a deed? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever they want to put on the deed. They could put the man in the moon for all I care, but it, it doesn't matter me. I want to work with the consumer that has the money and legally obligate them to be buying the house because. They don't belong to the money of the seller. And if I had Rick sign it and ask him, you know, Rick has no money. So why would he be the consumer if Zarice is the one giving him the cash? So Zarice can say, I, I'm going to put Rick down for the deed. Yeah. You know, it'll go through the title company. The title company will have to do a background check on Rick and possibly Zarice to make sure they don't have any outstanding tax liens, and things like that. But yes. Okay. And you're saying that that can help get it done. Yes. So they're the buyer, you know, you're working with different clients. They're the ones who are buying. All right, guys, I know we're a few minutes after one. I'm going to try and finish up here in the next 10 minutes. Um, showing a house, I'll go through this quickly. Uh, showing a house is not as easy as you think it is. People can watch on TV and eye and think that it's just so easy. I mean, they don't walk in with this and go, so this is the kitchen. This, I mean, Obviously, you know it's a kitchen. There's a toilet in the bathroom. It's the bathroom, right? But you do need to pay attention because when you're setting up a showing, are there dogs in the house? Are they in a crate in the basement? Are they in the garage? Are they asking you not to go in a certain room because there are animals in there? Um, and maybe they have anxiety or whatever. You need to pay attention to what's going on in these houses and these showing remarks. Um, are there cameras in the property? You might as well assume at this point there are probably cameras everywhere, whether it's on the front porch. So be careful having conversations with your client about saying good things, bad things, or anything personal because it's probably being recorded. Not that that's legal, but um, it, it's probably being recorded. So be careful of that. Key on time. I mean, when you're out showing three, four, five, eight houses in one day and you're running behind, text the listing agent, let them know that you are running behind because when you show up uh, and it's happened before at clients and agents an hour late, the buyer comes home and thinks it's odd that all the lights were left on in the house. But they have no idea if the consumer or the other agent were ever there. They're getting ready to cook dinner, and all of a sudden the agent shows up. Well, I had a showing. Yeah, we had a showing an hour ago. You're late. So you can't just surprise that on people, even if the house is vacant, uh, especially with COVID you know, going on when we were going through all that and still kind of lingering here. They may not want to go out and show. So you have to be cognizant of when you're allowed in the property. And it's definitely a violation of like walk through no property without permission from the the listing agent or the seller. So if you're going in at five o'clock and your showing was set up at three o'clock, you're probably in violation of what you should be doing. So what if you're like, uh, like you had a showing at five o'clock and you showed at four fifty-five? Is should you wait five minutes? No, you wouldn't necessarily have to wait five minutes as long as there's not another consumer there. Right. Um, you don't want to step on other agents too. There are a lot of agents that when it's their time in the house, don't you dare walk in that door. Um, I've seen agents slam doors, lock them in your face. I've seen agents take the key out of a lockbox and won't let anybody in until that time. Um, so just be professional. That's all I can say is, you know, if it's 455 and you can tell that the seller has left and the lights are on and you can go in, a few minutes is a few minutes. But when you're talking like 15, 20 minutes or more, you should probably be contacting the agent. Yeah, because I, I wasn't sure if, like, um, if I showed a few minutes early, could I? Reschedule, you know, for the five minutes. No, five minutes. Yeah, they are, but usually you have a window, you're okay. Yeah. Um, 
Um, never leave the lockbox open. So that's one of the biggest things. I know agents will give me snotty, dirty looks, even agents that know me and like me. But like when I leave a property, I make sure that the door is locked. I lock the key in the lockbox and I don't just hand it. So if Tiffany's walking up and I know she's from my brokerage or whatever, for all I know, her license got suspended last week and I don't even know it, right? So I am not just going to leave lockbox open and hand the key over to Tiffany. And be like, hey, hope your buyers like it. And all of a sudden, Tiffany doesn't lock up the house and the house gets robbed or something happened. Guess what? I locked the lockbox. I put the key in there. I made sure the house was completely secure. What happens after me, I can't control. But I can control who I'm giving that key to in that lockbox, especially on Supra's. If I, if I have a lockbox or if I have a super on a house and I don't see that every single time an agent is opening that, I know the agents are giving the key from one person to another. We have that issue. I mean, when we sold our house in New Mexico, the pest inspector supposedly came to the house, but the lockbox was never open. And then we had, it's like a lot of these things that we're talking about. I always jokingly like said, like, you know, the basement is covered in fire. So many times the lack of stuff that they did. I mean, are we have stuff you mean the people that you're yeah, in New Mexico? Mean, I think it's always a good idea to bring one or just walk through the house, see their vacation there for five to ten minutes, bring a dry erase thing with you, because I had kids just run their hands mm -hmm. on my Phillips head and then all down the wall. Yeah. And I was like, did these other agents just not care? And then we left their back door open. It's just, so yeah. It's, it's common it's courtesy. Awful. Yeah. So that's why I say it's not as easy as you think, like, Maybe a seller says, take off your shoes. I don't want your shoes in my house. Take off your shoes. I mean, um, so there are things that you need to do. Leave a card on the table, on the counter. That's always a great idea. That way the, the homeowner knows that you were there and gone. Because again, sometimes the, the instructions are, so I say, make sure that you lock all doors or not. One of the biggest things when I go on my listing appointments is I always tell people, I hope you have a key to your own house because most people don't. And I always tell them, do not, even though you don't have a key to your own house, I can tell you, I will tell an agent all day long, do not lock the door between the house and the garage because that's how my, my homeowner gets in. They have a garage door opener and they don't have a key. I'm going to tell you right now, every time they're going to get locked out of their house and they're going to show up. My fiance did it. When we went to sell his house. I was so mad. I said, make sure you have a key. And I explained it to him. Didn't have a key. I had to run over and let him in the damn house because an agent locked the door. Even though there was a note on the door that said, do not lock the door. Wait, you're so oh, it just cracks me up. It just cracks me up because it's like, you, you tell your client something and they don't listen. And so for him, it was just even more funny because it was like, you know, because I'm never right ever in my relationship. I'm always wrong. And so the one I was right. And so it felt really good. So it wasn't, it wasn't salty. I just like to pride myself that I was right. It's pretty bad that we have to next to the front door to lock the door or to do something. I mean, you just surprise people don't do it. They don't. And so you need to pay attention. And, and setting up lights, either turn them on, turn them off. If the showing instructions don't tell you explicitly leave lights on, turn the lights off. You know, you, you want to make sure that you're a good, good person. Sometimes it's like a wrong door. You're you may not have an opportunity. I mean, you don't even know it's going to be bad. Oh, yeah. I've I walked into houses where I think it got opened at eight o'clock in the morning. We're there at 10 o'clock and nobody has locked the lockbox or unlocked the lockbox. Yeah. Rick? Just a thought. Uh, just to leave a piece of business card so they know that you were there. Not that it happens a lot in this market. But keep in mind, if the house doesn't sell, at least have your, your business card now to call you when they need another yep. uh, agent. Not that you know, no, but that's a good point. Often, but... so what you're saying is throw out all the agents. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Wow. Now I know why Lynette is so specific, because he doesn't hear what you want him to hear. All right, uh, just a couple more here. So feedback after a showing, give clients, give the feedback to the other agent. It is so, I, I am such a stickler on it that in showing time, you can set how many number of times that the, the, the buyer's agent gets showing or feedback requests. Mine is max out of six. So it's gonna email you every single day until you get feedback on any tiers of house and under contract. It is so rude to show a house and then not give feedback because every consumer wants to know what was going on. Why didn't you make an offer on their house? They wanna know. Fill out the feedback. It doesn't take long. Send a text message, call the agent, do whatever. Showing time link. Um, working with other agents, be courteous. It's not about winning or losing. You know, here at KW, it's win-win or no deal. And it really is. You're going to work with these agents again. Um, you never know who your next broker is going to be. You never know who your next owner is going to be. You never know who your next 
team leader is going to be. You never know who your next agent coming in that you're going to want to partner with is going to be. You just never know. Now, there are some agents that you know you will never, ever get along with. And I get that. But for the most part, you need to be courteous. You need to pay attention to your relationship with the other agent because you will work with them again. And when you really want that offer accepted, you're going to beg, steal, and borrow to get your buyers that house. And that's happening right now. Um, Follow the rules, don't give away information. So, you know, if your client doesn't want you to let people know that there's a divorce situation because they don't want to be taken to the cleaners on an offer, don't tell people that the clients are getting divorced. Sometimes they can figure it out when there's only one spouse that's closed in the closet or whatever, and you kind of know what's going on, but you don't tell information that you shouldn't. Um, if your client doesn't tell you, you can say there's multiple offers. You can't say there's multiple offers. You know, you, you have to, the client is the one that's in the driver's seat. You are just the avenue in which for them to get their house sold. So communicate. I can't say that enough. If you are communicating with an agent, you need to make sure it is either phone, text, email, whatever. Things get lost in email and text messages. If you're sending over an offer, you better be reaching out to the agent to let them know there's an offer on the way because their email gets full. I think, you know what? I think, Marcy, didn't that happen to you not terribly long ago? Two, two offers that came in while I was on my way to the sellers, and we had about three offers. Yep. So I don't know if they can. Yep. When I left the house, I left the house. Yep. No, so, they never told me they were. Yep. So and two agents' offers didn't get sad. presented because they never ended up letting you know. Yeah, it's sad. Um, earnest money deposits, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, cash is not acceptable. We do not take cash, so don't collect it. Um, personal check is acceptable. Uh, it's up to $10,000 for a cashier's check. That's acceptable. Anything over $10,000, you cannot take a, a, a check. Um, wire is acceptable. That's probably the preferred way. Or now that Stonegate and a lot of other title companies have it online, we do not hold earnest money in our brokerage. It's always going to be held by the other brokerage or the title company. Make sure that there's a link on their website. They can, the buyer can go ahead and deposit money directly with them. <clears throat> so who's holding the earnest money? You definitely need to know who's holding the earnest money. And no matter what side of the transaction you're on, you need to make sure that the earnest money is collected. So it is your job as the buyer's agent to make sure that earnest money gets to where it needs to go. Meaning that if the client says, yes, I went on Stonegate's website, you should be getting an email from Stonegate saying that the, the money is there. If they are sending a check, they should send you a copy of the check. So you can send a copy of the check to the other agent. No matter what side you're on, even if you're on the listing side, you need to make sure that that earnest money has been collected. Okay. Um, send a copy of the check. Let's see. Do, 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 do. How does the client get the earnest money back? There are only four ways in the state of Ohio that earnest money is ever distributed. Again, Cerise, it doesn't matter the situation. There are only four ways. You know what is. There are only four ways. It is upon a successful closing, which is the best way. That's what we like. The other way is a signed mutual release by all parties. The third way would be a court order, and the fourth would be after two years, it can be written back to the party that wrote it. It doesn't matter any what it's in there. Those are the only four ways. Okay. All right. And so if the deal falls apart, that's how you're getting the money back. Seller's net sheets, you can use the title capture. Um, I always recommend that when you're going on a listing appointment, you do a seller net sheet. Make sure you look up the property taxes because the property taxes are going to tell you if the client is behind. Have they paid their sewer bill? And I've heard this before. I didn't pay my sewer bill because I can't shut it off. Well, guess what? When it's three, four, seven hundred dollars later, um, somebody's got to pay that before it transfers. And those are things that all you can see on the auditor's website on what they're paying. Is there a street lighting? Um, I guess yeah. assessment. Thank you. My mind went blank. Um, are there any kind of assessment? So make sure you're paying attention to that. And I will let you guys go unless there's any questions. I know we kept you a little bit. See if we can turn that into like a three-hour class. It's terrible. Thanks, guys.